Welcome. My name is Scott Edinburgh. I'm the founder of Personal MBA Coach, uh, and I'm excited here to talk to you about top 10 MBA application pitfalls. Uh, so thanks so much for, for joining as part of the Spotlight series. I know we might have engaged on some uh, other events with, with GMAT Club. And I will be joined by a former client and uh, Stanford GSB alum, uh, Sarab, who's just uh, running a little bit late from, from a meeting. So he'll be, he'll be joining shortly and he'll talk a little bit about his experiences with us and then at, at Stanford uh, in general. So if you have any questions, please post them in the, the comment section. And um, you know, our folks at GMAT Club and myself will be monitoring and we'll answer any questions uh, towards the end of the, the session. Often the Q&A is the most valuable part of this, uh, this process and these presentations. So please ask any and uh, all, all questions. So a little bit about uh, myself, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting so far. Uh, again, my name is Scott Edinburgh. I'm recording this from, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts right now. It's right near MIT where I went to undergrad. I studied economics and business at Sloan and was a teaching assistant for one of the MBA courses as an undergrad. Then I worked at Deloitte in consulting for a few years and mergers and acquisitions, and I went to Wharton for the MBA. I picked Wharton because when I was in high school, I took a couple summers of economics classes at Wharton, really liked the curriculum, and wanted to go back for uh, business school. I thought I might you know, go into real estate. Uh, that's a great healthcare program. And so I went there. I had a fantastic time at Wharton. I actually founded Personal MBA Coach when I was a first-year student because my uh, best friend, Raja, was applying to schools. He hired another admissions consultancy that uh, had a bit more of a standard process, a large team, sort of paired with one of the consultants from the team. Long story short, ended up not thinking the uh, essays were, were quite what I wanted them, them to be. And you know, I can tell you more about sort of that process later if, if you want to reach out uh, privately. But in any case, he got into Harvard, then helped another friend get into Harvard Business School. Another one got into Wharton. And we just expanded from there. Uh, so now, you know, 13 years later, kind of top consultant on a lot of the different uh, ranking sites, uh, was a speaker at the GMAT conference last summer, where we talked a lot about recommendation letter, authenticity and various other details to a large uh, team of admissions directors. We have a 96% success rate. And last year, it was actually over $6 million of scholarship uh, that were awarded. So to my knowledge, it's more than anyone else out there in the space. Now, a bit more about you know myself and kind of what we do here at Personal MBA Coach, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation in just a minute. So we offer complete uh, tutoring support for the GMAT, GRE, and uh, executive assessment. And we have in-house software that we use to guide through the uh, system with like modules and sample questions, thousands of answers, full length exams. Some time is really spent like teaching concepts, you know, teacher to student, how to think through these questions a little bit more efficiently. We'll watch you answer questions live, stop you along the way and say, you know, let's add this number here. Let's move this over there. You know, here's how I might want to uh, think about this in a little bit more of a strategic way. And most people are doing like 20 to 30 hours of, of tutoring. Uh, we do have former, uh, you know, Wharton and UCLA admissions uh, director support on our team. So for anyone that wants former uh, admissions insight, we do have that as well. And I'm on the board of directors for uh, AGAC. That's the Association of International Graduate Admissions Consultants. And uh, happy to talk more about that, you know, separately. But, you know, it's a great group of admissions consultants. And we have an annual conference with admissions directors. Uh, every year, actually, we do a lot of things. We even, like, analyze these fake applications and kind of determine you know, who's getting accepted and, and rejected. So we sort of see how they make their decisions. Now we help folks through early MBA planning. If anyone isn't applying now, you know, you're applying in a future year, let's say one or two, or maybe even three years from now, usually one year out and you want help to improve your profile. Like what are the things that you want to be doing? Let's add more extracurriculars. Let's get, you know, an additional uh, leadership opportunity under the belt, maybe start a nonprofit. I really think about your whole profile and story and what ways that we can improve it between now and then, we can help you with that. Um, and we also have uh, a team of former M7 uh, and even beyond, you know, top 10 and some top 15 uh, MBA interviewers on our team. So a lot of folks used to interview for many of these schools. Um, and so we do some great interview prep support. Last year, our interview conversion rate was anywhere from 70 to 85%, depending on uh, the school. And that compares to the average of about 50%. So, you know, we do uh, quite well and have clients to network with at all of the, the top schools. So that's a little bit about us. Now, for those of you who are thinking of applying in round two, it's coming up. If you haven't already started writing essays and you're looking for some support, you know, reach out because we're sort of running short on time here. You know, you have just about a couple months until you want to be wrapped up. 
And ideally, you're not even rushing with edits in the last couple of weeks or so. So now is really the time to get moving. It's a competitive year. Um, you know, a lot of people are applying. Applicant numbers are up across most of the, the top schools. And it will be a, a tough year. You know, we have some initial results from, you know, some schools that have released information and we've gotten a lot of great people in, but I will tell you, it's, it's a tougher year than last year. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different world out there. And so you really wanna make sure to put your best foot forward. Most people are applying to more schools. Last year, five was our most common number. This year, it's probably gonna be six. We're seeing a lot of people applying to seven schools. You know, they're getting 10 or 20 points higher on the GMAT to try to overcome this uh, competitiveness. So pitfalls, right? One is illogical career goals. Now, a lot of people are looking to make, um, you know, pivots in their career. And I moderated a, a couple panels yesterday and a couple the day before on uh, career changes and, you know, making sort of career career pivots, right? So if you are making a career pivot, you know, it's totally fine to do so. Um, a lot of people make, you know, uh, career kind of pivots and, and changes. But when doing so, you really want to make sure to explain it in a real sort of succinct way. So there are four different ways that you can pivot, right? One is, is industry, one is uh, function, the other is geography, and the other is language. So let's say you're pivoting in all four of these ways. I really wanna think through how are we communicating this, right? What is the reason behind this, this pivot? Um, and how can I convince an admissions director that this is the right pivot for me, this is the right move for me, and uh, I'm really going to be able to be successful in this in this endeavor. Now, overall, and I could talk for an hour just on goals. Goals are a really important part of this process. But overall, right, you really want to be uh, decisive and specific. So one set of goals, right, short-term goal and a long-term goal, and then you explain, you know, why you want to do uh, each. And then what the school will do to help you to, to get there. So this isn't the time to say, you know, or or that you want to find yourself in business school and you know figure out what the right strategy should be and, and you know determine the best sort of approach for you, right? This is the time to have a real specific plan and know exactly what you're doing and how to communicate it. Then once you get to school, you can of course make a different, a different plan, and that's totally fine. Uh, so again, any questions, just ask them in, in uh, the comments and we'll take all the questions at the end. Um, I'm sure there's some, some great questions here. So next is letters of recommendation, right? Pitfall is asking your company CEO to write your letter of recommendation. You do not need to ask the head of the company or the head of the group, or the person that happens to be a Stanford GSB graduate, right? Pick people that know you, right? Pick people that actually believe in you, understand your background and what you've done, how you've succeeded, you know, how you've accomplished things. All right, these are the types of people that you want to ask to write your rec letters. The bar for letters of recommendation is really, really high, especially when firms like Personal MBA Coach get involved in this process. Because what we do is, for one thing, we can help uh, help applicants to pick the recommenders. Then we have what I call our LOR one pager, which is like a cheat sheet guide that we work on and pass to the recommenders. We give them some talking points, right? Make it a little bit easier for them to write their their rec letters. Then they go off and write the letters, and they might even share it with us. We do a review and we make some comments. You know, we're not editing the letters, of course. Recommenders do have to write it in their own words, but we can review and give some high-level strategic comments for things that they can do to improve the letters. And so once that happens, the letters end up being pretty strong. So you really want to find someone who is writing a very, very strong letter and super specific. So specific, I mean, they're not just saying Mary Jane was one of the best consultants we've ever had and I'm thrilled to have her on board. She manages teams and works with people and is very analytical and you'd be silly not to accept her at XYZ school. To me, that letter is worthless. That says absolutely nothing, and I don't really have a sense for what this applicant will actually do or what this applicant has done in her career uh, to date. You really wanna be specific. And so as you coach your recommenders, right, tell them some of these specific things that you've done. You don't wanna write you know, any like sentences out for them, makes it too risky. Uh, you want them to really draft everything on their own, but you can certainly have a conversation, right? And tell them the things that you've done, remind them of these things and ask them to be super specific. In some cases, you can actually ask non-professional uh, recommenders to write these letters. So if you're, you know, like a volunteer and a, a nonprofit, let's say you're doing a lot of work and you want to ask, you know, one of these people to talk about your experiences, that might be a good, a good person. Um, so next is job description bullets on the resume. Don't use job description bullets, right? So if you think you're using a job description bullet, then 
you probably are. Um, and often we read resumes that uh, sound like anyone in your company could have written it. The goal is to be unique and to stand out. And so as you're doing this, it doesn't mean you have to be the first and only person ever you know, to do X, Y, Z in your organization, but show some of the strengths that you have, right? Highlight leadership. You want to have this uh, focus on results. So we're not saying what the job entails, and we're not really focusing on like a lot of technical details, but we're really just focusing on the results, you know, who you worked with, how you did this, what the results were, and that's super important, right? Figure out the key skills that you want to demonstrate to a school. Now, if you think about it, you don't have to know everything before going to business school. In fact, if you do, if you come to the table and you tell an admissions director, hey, you know, I've been the best trader in XYZ or I'm a top banker and here's everything that I've done and I'm, I'm so amazing. You know, they might wonder, are you really ready to go to business school? You know, what are some things that you're not good at? Like, what do you need to learn? Why do you want to go to school? Um, so you do want to be honest about you know, things that you're good at and things that you're not good at. Uh, but at the end of the day, you want to try to show that you have done the work better than peers or better than uh, the expectations. Right. And so that's something that you should certainly be thinking about. Next pitfall is not including school specifics. So uh, here are a couple examples of, you know, from MIT and, and Kellogg, right? You don't want to be excited to take Kellogg's marketing classes or, you know, study business fundamentals or learn analytics at MIT Sloan. It's not really going to tell the admissions director that you know a lot about the programs and that you've thought very specifically about how the program will help you to accomplish your goals. Yes, those things might be true, right? Kellogg might have some good marketing classes and anyone that knows anything about business schools probably knows that, right? But more importantly, you wanna show the schools why you wanna to go to their program and be super detailed and specific. So for one thing, speaking of Kellogg as an example, you can tell this is an old slide, right? I've probably given this talk hundreds of times before. Kellogg doesn't actually ask about Kellogg in their essays this year. So you don't really wanna write about Kellogg at all. And some places will advise you to do so. Some alums or students will, will say that, but you know we haven't done that at all since the questions came out and we did extremely well last year. Um, so we don't recommend writing about Kellogg and their essays at all actually, because they don't ask about that. But for schools that do ask about why you want to go to their school, or let's say if you're you know interviewing for a school like, like Kellogg, right? be specific about what you want to be doing on campus. So what's the value that you will add? And if you're writing something, give, you know, maybe a quick sort of piece of advice here, more detail than we usually give in these videos. Um, but let's say you're doing the MIT cover letter. You want to say what you're going to be doing to actually improve the campus at MIT. And that's something that a lot of people just miss out on. You really need to focus on that. If you want more details, you know, reach out to us and we'd be happy to chat about how we can work with you on these, on these applications. But that's something that, you know, often is a miss in their, their app. So in any case, show school specifics. Next is having a vague reason for wanting an MBA. So to be clear, right, this is not the career goals, right? The goals are what you wanna do after business school. And instead of what you wanna do after business school, right, this is the reason for why you want the MBA. So for those of you just joining, um, see the numbers were ticking up. My name is Scott Edinburgh. I'm the founder of Personal MBA Coach. We're a boutique admissions consulting and uh, tutoring firm. I went to MIT for undergrad, Wharton for my MBA, and we help applicants from around the world get into uh, top schools and with lots of scholarship dollars, over six million last year. We're talking about top 10 application pitfalls. So you don't want to just learn business schools in business school, uh, business skills in business school. Um, you want to make sure that you're not just trying to check the box here. So if you're a consultant, and I was a consultant, I you know, worked at a major consulting firm and most of my colleagues ended up going to business school. So it was kind of, you know, understood that I would do that as well. But I had to get specific about the reasons why I wanted to go to school and what I actually wanted to learn from the program. Um, so, you know, level set here, right? Talk about where your gaps are. Try to avoid things like strong fundamentals or, you know, developing like business knowledge, right? Things that you really don't need to convey because everyone's going to develop strong fundamentals. I'd rather hear you write about the fact that you don't have a lot of exposure to the Spanish market and you have some ancestors from there and you're kind of interested in how business is done and you like to learn another language and you want to figure out how to negotiate in 
X situation. Like that's super, super detailed. Nobody else is going to have that probably who's applying, um, but that's good, right? Because that's something that you want. And now you're being honest with the school. So next is not answering the question, this funny looking icon person. Um, this is a real pitfall, right? We get lots of essays from applicants. And, uh, you know, sometimes we see essays that just aren't answering the question. So, you know, one suggestion that we have for all of our clients have personal be a coach is to actually write the, the question name um, on top of the answer, right? So you write the question, you write the word count, and then you write your answer down below. That makes sure that you're reflecting back and, you know, being honest about what the question is and making sure that you're actually answering it. Um, more commonly than just a total miss of the question, right, is I'm not writing the right, you know, balance and percentage of words, let's say, right? So a school asks about, you know, uh, let's take let's take Columbia Business School, for instance, right? So, so one of our favorite schools, right? So let, let's take Columbia, okay? Um, they ask about what you want to do post MBA and you write 250 words about your background, your parents, some challenges and why you are super passionate about, you know, finance and the developing world. Well, the background might be relevant for you, but it's not relevant to the question because they don't really ask about that. So, you know, that's an example where you really want to pay attention to the question and see if they don't ask about your, your backstory, then it's probably best to not write about that and just focus on what the question is actually asked. Now, there's some exceptions here. Like we do something sort of different with, you know, the first essay with, uh, with, with Columbia, but, you know, you have to work with an expert that actually knows what's happening and understands the process and the admissions directors and that sort of thing inside and out to know how to actually address it. If you're doing it on your own, though, really just stick to the, the question. Um, and, you know, different schools are placing, you know, uh, varying importance on different criteria. Right. So some schools really want to know more about your leadership. Some schools want to know more about communication. You know, um, everything is, you know, kind of different for each. And it's important to, you know, think, think through it. Um, so. Okay. Uh, so next is using uh, too many buzzwords. Right. You want to you want to try to not use buzzwords at all. I shouldn't even say too many. I should just say, like, you know, don't use don't use buzzwords. Right. Because um, they're not really helpful. Um, if there's a word that, you know, and that you don't think someone outside of your industry will know, um, then it's probably best not to not to use it. Um, so leave that for the concierge lounge or since nobody's traveling now, you know, for <clears throat> something else. Right. And there are a couple of reasons for this one is that if you are sending your application into lots of different schools and lots of different people will read them from lots of different schools, it's possible that not everybody fully understands this term that you're using, right? Or otherwise, even if they do understand it, they might not actually want to read it, right? Because they want to test to see how you can communicate your experience um, and you know your skills and your life to different people. When you're in business school, you will be talking with students from a lot of different backgrounds, right? And so students come from, you know, all walks of life. And it's it's probably good to, you know, kind of test yourself to see how you can, you know, communicate um, to people that don't really understand what it is that you've done. So focus on transferable skills, right? Results, personal characteristics, et cetera. This picture probably has nothing to do with lack of consistency, but in any case, lack of consistency across the application, right? Uh, your application should paint a picture of one person, right? You're one applicant. Now, admissions directors read applications and, you know, every school spends a different number of like minutes on, on the apps, um, you know, specifically, but, you know, by and large, right, they, they read applications, they spend a certain amount of time on it and then they go to committee, right? And so maybe one person is reading, um, uh, you know, like 10 applications one afternoon and then they go back and they have a meeting at 5 p.m., and say, so tell me what you think. And so you have to make it easy for them to go back to the team and say, okay, like, here's why we want Scott. Okay. These are the things that he's done. This is where he's from. This is what he's accomplished. This is what he wants to get out of the school. And he's really shown interest. You know, he's talked to a few students. He's gone to some of our events. He's pretty specific about what he wants out of the program. I can tell it makes sense. The goals are realistic. They're pretty achievable. 
you know, they're kind of aggressive, but like not too aggressive. And so I can see that he will be a, a good fit on campus for these two reasons, right? You don't want, even if you've done 12 amazing things, you don't want them all to sort of come out in this process um, because you want to be, you want to be clear, right? We'll have one sort of key theme that's tying everything together. If the uh, application isn't consistent, it might seem like it's not super genuine and like you're trying too hard, but this doesn't mean you want too much repetition or too many red and white bikes. Um, you only have so many essays, right? You have a resume, maybe one essay, maybe two essays, maybe three essays, usually not more than three, but sometimes yes. Um, you have two letters of recommendation and you have an interview. So there's a limited number of areas in which you can uh, you know, kind of tell folks about you and you wanna make sure that you're not repeating yourself too much. I had an applicant who um, got into MIT, Wharton, and Kellogg uh, last year. Um, and we sent more folks to all three of those schools last year than we've ever had before. Um, but in any case, this applicant had a really, really good project, right? And that that was their like leading sort of hallmark to their, their career. Um, and it was in the resume. It was taking up a couple of bolts in the resume. And I knew the recommender was going to write about it. So we actually didn't write about it in one of the essays. It would have been a good answer to that essay. It probably would have been a better answer than we used. I think we used like an A minus or a B plus example. And this was certainly an A plus example. But we didn't use it because, you know, it was already highlighted in two other places in the application. And I felt like I didn't want to show them the same, the same thing. So I'd rather have like an A plus and an A minus example than the same A plus example in two areas, right? Again, you want to be well-rounded um, and show that you have more than one accomplishment. So next is not properly engaging with the school. So clearly this is an old deck. Again, visit when reasonable. It's not reasonable to visit now. Do not visit, do not ask about visiting. That's not happening. But what's nice is everybody's on a level playing field, right? So people are watching you know, this video uh, around the world and some people just you know, kind of struggle with uh, you know, being able to kind of get, get to campus and now you don't have to worry about it, right? Everybody's remote, um, but there's a lot that you can do in the remote world and it's actually easier. And there are you know, fewer excuses for not doing things, right? You couldn't open up your computer and click a mouse and you know, go to an event for an hour while you're you know, maybe cooking dinner or something, right? So you really wanna be doing these things. However, it's not a level playing field. And I won't go into details on this video, but some schools really care about visiting. They want to see that you're engaged. They wanna see that you're researching the school and talking to students. And if you don't do that, guess what? you're probably SOL and you're not likely to get accepted. And then there are other schools that do not care. Uh, visiting and engagement is not part of their evaluation process. So it's literally just not a, a factor. So you wanna think strategically about how you spend your time, what you're doing and how you're making the most of all of your resources, even if resources is just an evening on your, on your computer and ask smart questions, right? So we have you know, some sort of key questions that we recommend um, our clients to ask when they go to these events and you know, ways to, you know, ways to kind of network with folks, even in a remote world. And so make sure to ask the, the smart questions. So, you know, this is a, a subset of where our clients uh, go. I mean, we send people to all of the, the top schools. So there's really no school out there that we don't have clients at. And usually we have events with, with former clients when I'm you know, traveling to different places to, to give talks. Um, so they're going to all the top schools and uh, again, over 6 million scholarships last year. So for those who are just joining, uh, a little bit, you know, late. I went to MIT, uh, worked at Deloitte, and went to Wharton for my uh, MBA. Um, you know, top consultant on many, you know, different sort of rankings. Uh, and we offer complete service throughout the uh, entire process, from you know, tutoring, early MBA planning, uh, interview prep with former MBA interviewers, um, and in any case, some other other details that you can sort of rewind and listen to. Uh, again, I won't, won't bore you with telling you the same things over and over again. So a little bit more about what, what we do and how we're kind of going through the process, right? The first step is brainstorming. And uh, this is a very, very high level overview. So if you're interested in engaging with us and uh, potentially working together, then you know, reach out and let's schedule time to have a uh, conversation. So you can just visit our website, personalmbacoach.com. My email address is scott, a C-O-T-T, -T, at personalmbacoach.com. And we'll go into much more depth in terms of our process. But, you know, we're doing tutoring, right? We're doing brainstorming, figuring out what your story is, selecting the schools. You know, we have template for the resume. So your resume can be as strong as it can be. We have guides for essays that show you what our secret sauce is, 100 words on this, 200 words on that. We're really, you know, guiding you through what our strategy should be, right? We're doing essay editing, 
letter of recommendation guidance, interview prep with a lot of former interviewers. And we have a lot of templates uh, in place to help you through the whole process. So you're not just like sending essays to a consultant and kind of waiting for a response. We have a whole system with calendars and deadlines and tasks. So we keep things pretty, pretty structured. Um, here's a little guide if you want to uh, download. So personalmediacoach.com slash kickstart sign up. And uh, you can also just you know visit the website, personalmediacoach.com. You know, drop us a note and we'd be happy to schedule time to have a, a consultation. Uh, so I'm going to go to some some questions now and I'll leave on I'll leave on this slide. And then we'll flip over to, to questions. Yeah, so feel free to ask any questions in um, the, the comment section. Um, so here's one. Can we talk about deferred uh, admission? Yes. So um, and uh, Jolyn, so please. Um, Please, I'll show this on the screen and I'll take it away. Uh, please ask a more specific question because I'll talk a little bit about deferred admission, but you know, would love to answer your uh, specific question here as well. So please just retype if you want uh, something more, more uh, specific answered. But for deferred MBA admission, so we do a lot of work with uh, deferred applicants. Uh, many schools offer deferred admission. This is for people that are in college and they want to apply while they're in college to secure you know, a spot ahead of time for, for the future. A lot of what I talked about would resonate for the deferred uh, admissions process. There are some differences, right? In the in the sense that um, you know uh, they're they're not really excuse me they're not really super focused on your long term goal as much as you know they would be in the regular uh, application process. Partly because you're just too young. You know, if you're looking for deferred admission, you're likely a senior in college. 20 years old and you know what you want to do when you're when you're you know 33 is uh, who knows right um so don't worry as much about that but you really want to show them why you think that school is the right strategy for you and kind of even like more importantly you know why this is going to allow you to do different things right so for instance if you were going to mckinsey and consulting and you apply to harvard through the deferred admission um you know, they might just kind of wonder, well, what if they say no to you, right? And they come back to you two or three years later, um, and then you you apply again. Like, would you still be applying? You know, so so some schools are really interested to see, like, why do you want to get the acceptance now? What are you going to be doing that's different if you have that acceptance now versus if you don't have that? And that's an important thing to, to think about. Um, and again, Joel, and please ask a, a more specific question, and I'll be happy to answer. Um, hello from Ecuador. Hello from Ecuador as well. I. I started a nonprofit organization. Our first exposition was in Ecuador. Um, <clears throat> can you get details for your service? Yes. Yeah, so I'll I'll type in. So I'll type the website here for you, um, and all the details are on our on our website. So feel free to just jump on here, and this is in the comments, um, and check out uh, everything. Uh, that you want. And again, we're happy to have a consultation to tell you, you know, all about what we do. We offer tutoring, we offer the application support for the packages, um, you know, interview prep, resume reviews, that sort of thing. Um, and yes, so great question here. Do we offer admissions consulting services for master's programs at business schools? Yes. So we do um, all kinds of programs. And, you know, today we're focused a little bit more on the MBA uh, admissions consulting process, but we do a lot of public policy programs. Harvard Kennedy School, you know, says we do law school. We have a Yale law grad on, on our team actually help with all the law school applications and the LSAT, LSAT tutoring. So uh, Masters of Finance, Masters of Analytics. We have an interview on our website with uh, Diane Jordan, who runs uh, MIT's uh, Master, Master Finance program. Uh, that's uh, a blog on our website. So we do all, uh, all kinds of uh, graduate, graduate programs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, so can you choose a recommender from your previous company? Here, I'll show the question. Can you choose a recommender from your previous company where you were not for a long time, but you did not, where you were, where you were not for a long time, but you did demonstrate good skills and growth potential at work? Um, so yeah, that, that's a good question. And I'll you know, kind of rephrase this a little bit as well, right? How long do you need to work with somebody before you can ask them to be a, a recommender? And this really does vary, you know. Um, I would say, ideally, we're having six months, um, you know, and ideally, it's like a year or two. 
Um, if it's just a few months, it's probably not good. Um, if you have a lot of growth and a lot of skills and a lot of accomplishments, then I think you, you know, certainly can, uh, you know, you certainly can ask that that person. Um, but you want to try to not go too far back, <clears throat> right? If you've been working for six years and you ask, you know, someone who, um, you know, came, you know, uh, you you let's say you worked with them like you know five years ago, uh, <clears throat> and that's very early in your career. I might not go, you know, that far back. Um, let's see. So, okay. Any advice for applicants with, uh, with very little relevant experience? Well, you know, so first of all, Jacob, I, I would say like, what is relevant experience, right? I mean, in business school, you need to do a lot, right? You need to communicate, you need to be analytical, you need to be influential, you need to make decisions, you need to take risks. Um, arguably, whatever you're doing, you have experience with like some of these things. So you might not be super analytical, let's say, um, but um, you know, I think your experience could be relevant even if you don't think it really is. Um, you know, um, so uh, the advice is think about what are the transferable skills, right? What are you doing? at work or in education or whatever you're doing now in, in your life, you know, what are you doing now and how, you know, is that relevant for the, the business school uh, environment? We have a lot of non-traditional applicants, right? We have people that come from family business. We actually have expertise in family businesses. Um, we have people who are physicians, uh, actually growing number from the medical community are, are, you know, coming to us and want to go to, uh, to business school, right? We have people coming from the nonprofit world, you know, teachers, lawyers. Um, so even if you don't have relevant uh, experience or what you think is not relevant, you can certainly you know, still be a leader uh, in your space and can then you know, make some great contributions to the business school uh, environment. Um, so who is a good candidate for writing your LOR? Partner at your firm? Is it okay if it's a junior partner? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned a little bit about this, um, you know, before earlier in the presentation. I know people are sort of coming and going here. Uh, so the title and the prestige actually doesn't matter at all. So it could be a partner in the firm. It could be a junior partner. It could be a manager. As long as it's somebody who is above you and can really speak to your qualifications, right, can mention what you're doing day in and day out, you know, how you're performing and why it's better than what someone else is doing, uh, that could be a great person. So don't worry too much about the title. And in fact, um, so that sometimes if people are too senior, then they don't have as much time to work with you and their letters might not be as uh, strong or as specific, actually. So, yeah, don't worry, you know, don't worry too much about the, the, the title here. OK, so if one is working in a small firm, yet big impact work wise and not traditionally feeder for MBA schools, how can one make their application attractive? Yeah, so if you're working at, at a smaller, you know, a smaller place uh, that doesn't send a lot of people to, to business school, which by the way is totally fine. Um, there's no problem with that. You know, I feel like if I were making this robotic person to apply to business school, I would probably create an applicant that you might not think I would, I would create, right? It wouldn't be the... I mean, I worked at Deloitte Consulting. Like, I might not be working at Deloitte. Nothing against Deloitte. I think it's fantastic. But we see so many really strong non-traditional people get in and, you know, be able to really kind of rise to the top that I wouldn't worry about coming from a smaller firm. So what should you be doing? A few things, right? One is you really want to show what you're doing day in and day out at work that might be different from someone who's working at a larger firm. Perhaps your friend is working in the same industry at a larger firm and your friend is maybe sitting behind a computer doing a lot of analysis and doing sort of the same thing over and over again, whereas you're not just doing the analysis, you're talking to the, the contractor, you're working with, with the lawyer, you're, you're figuring out, you know, leases or something, you know, what are you doing that's actually different and that's a little bit more. So that, that kind of, you know, falls in line with like the you know, responsibility, right? If you have you know, more responsibility and, you know, what you're doing kind of day in and day, right? Highlight this responsibility, um, show them your, your progression and, you know, more specific, more importantly, rather, you know, why, why this is the right, you know, decision for you, right? Are you going to apply to, to business school now? Um, 
Okay, so if I work at a consulting firm as a knowledge consultant, will be compared against strategy consultants as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I'd love you to send me across your resume so that I can give you real specific feedback on your profile and how you can you know, compare to others and what schools you might wanna uh, compete for. I think that would be most helpful for you. The, the quick answer is, you know, there's probably a little bit of a, of a difference there. And I would say if I'm looking at competitiveness, um, you know, I'm a knowledge consultant and, you know, someone working in strategy consulting at, you know, a top firm, there might be a little bit of a, of a, of a difference, but I do want to look at everything together because the firm is only one thing. And sometimes we have, you know, examples where someone, you know, is working in maybe like a mid office, you know, role or even a back office role, but what they've done is super impressive. And so in some ways they're actually a stronger applicant than someone who's in, in a front office, front office role. Um, but you're probably directionally accurate there. Um, how can I make up for a lack of extracurricular or volunteering in recent years? So yeah, that's a great question. You know, we have we have these early MBA uh, planning packages, and I, I, I mentioned that you know a little bit a little bit earlier, where we guide people through what they should be doing to perfect their profile. You know, between now and when they're uh, ready to to apply, All right? And so you can do a lot. I mean, you can start new organizations, you can find new leadership opportunities at existing organizations. I love working with people who are early on because the, the world is their oyster, so to speak, and we can you know, decide what we can do to improve their profile and uh, their resume. Now, it depends when you're applying. You know, If it's end of October and you're applying in the end of November, or you're applying to Stern and you're submitting on November 15th, I mean, we really can't do that much with you. You're, you sort of have what, what you have. Um, but if you are planning ahead for the, for the future, then there's definitely a lot that we can do to improve your, your profile. Uh, for international students, submit English tests later will make applicants lose their edge or not, and the score of IR and AWA will be considered by adcoms. So I'll rephrase this a little bit here. Um, you know, how, how do admissions directors look at IR and AWA? So IR is definitely analyzed. It didn't used to be analyzed at all. And then school started to look at it a little bit, and now it, it, it is evaluated. So that is uh, part of this process. Now, is it super important? Is it the most uh, crucial piece? I would say no. You know, this is where the quant score is going to be a lot more important. But the IR is definitely evaluated. AWA is looked at in conjunction with your, your essays. So, you know, if, if your writing is very strong, and obviously, you know, if we work with you, we can, we can help you with that, that portion. Um, and your, you know, AWA is good, but not amazing. It's probably okay. You don't want huge discrepancies. So you don't want an amazing AWA and then, you know, really poor essays, nor do you want perfect essays and a very low AWA that would sort of call, call question. Um, but they are parts of the, the process. And as far as the timing for submitting like a TOEFL or, or an IELTS, I would just follow the school's direction, right? If a school is going to take a late TOEFL from you, then I would go with it and I would, you know, take it whenever you want to take it as it would kind of make sense. Um, so which schools in M7 place a higher emphasis on leadership skills? You know, I mean, you know, Harvard is the most, you know, well-known school that, that really talks about leadership a lot. And so I would say that's definitely one that appreciates leadership, but truthfully, all schools want leaders, right? If you think about it, they're educating you to, you know, improve yourself, improve the community. You know, Yale has this like for business and, you know, society. Um, I don't think that there's, you know, one school that's necessarily really focused on leaders and other schools are not focused on, on, on leaders. All schools want you to be a leader and uh, to show your leadership experiences to date. But if you think about what the school is known for, maybe how analytical the program is, right? If you have super strong analytical skills and you've solved lots of problems, but they've always been at the, you know, like supporter role and you haven't led anything, well, then your argument could be, well, now I'm going to school to learn how to develop those skills to be a leader. So, you know, take this with, uh, with a grain of salt, let's say here. Um, so here's a question. So I might apply to MBA deferred programs. I worked at a leadership level in an NGO. Great. But the schools ask for two LORs, one from academics and the other from professional, and I did not do an internship. So this sounds like a very specific question I, I'd, I'd love to tackle with you um, offline. The one thing that I can say here sort of publicly without knowing more about you is that, um, you know, if you're leading in an NGO, that certainly sounds like uh, 
a professional role. So that could count as the professional letter. Professional does not have to be you're working at Goldman Sachs in investment banking. You know, working in an NGO certainly counts um, as professional work. And so you can get a letter from that. Um, any, oh, great to see you. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming in. Uh, so is a recommendation from a mentor uh, for your whole career, but you worked with formally early in your career with an informal working relationship to date, a good recommendation. Um, so I would say potentially, right? Potentially that's a good, that's a good person to get a recommendation from. It depends how closely they followed you and how they can talk to your performance versus others. But honestly, it also depends like who else they're mentoring and what else they're doing. So if this is somebody who happens to be an executive at, you know, Roche, let's say, and you've been following them and they're a family friend of yours and they you know talk about your your performance and, and how you've sort of progressed through your career um just sort of talking about you but they haven't really done this for other people that might not be a good person but if this is someone who's more of like a career mentor you know they, they do this for you they do this for lots of other people they've guided you through they've given you hard feedback you know they've, they've criticized you you've really grown through this relationship then that person could be good so i would be a little bit hesitant to be honest um from what I'm hearing, but it's definitely you know possible uh, that this could be a good person to ask. And we can certainly talk more about that offline. I had a small business with a couple of friends in university for around 18 months. We did 10 to 15 projects. How does that help my profile? We made some money and shut the company and uh, before graduating. Well, so that shows that you have some entrepreneurship experience, right? You've started something. You know, you grew it to some level, 10 to 15 projects. I don't know what, what the size of these projects are, you know, but certainly you've 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 done work um, and then you've probably managed some other people along the way. You know, I don't think this is going to be a game changer in your applications, to be honest, but I think it certainly does show a little bit of initiative uh, and it shows that you know how to, you know, start things from, from the ground up. So it's definitely good to mention. Um, I don't think I would make that the hallmark of your application though. I'm 33 years old with eight years of work experience. Regarding those facts, what are my possibilities to be admitted to a top 10 program? So uh, please reach out, send an email, scott at personalmbacoach.com. We'd love to do a profile evaluation separately. I would need to know more information about you um, to determine whether you can get into a top 10 MBA program. But what I can say is, you know, if you have eight years of work experience, you're still in range. So you can certainly apply. You are a little bit on the more experienced side. Schools do look at the years of experience. They don't evaluate age. So they would be looking at the years of experience. And if you have eight now, then you would have nine upon matriculation. So you are sort of, you know, pushing it at a, at a full-time program, but we definitely send people with nine years of experience. I would want to see really strong GPA, really strong, you know, test scores uh, and like strong work experience um, itself. So, so reach out and give me some more information and we can chat offline. So another question about older applicants. Um, for older applicants, how will the application package be evaluated? Will focus and expectations differ from younger applicants? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, expectations definitely differ because if you have, let's say you have, you know, six years of experience versus three years, of, I was talking to someone yesterday and, you know, we were trying to decide last night whether he's applying now or whether he's waiting another year to apply. And he just, he just made manager recently. And I said, you know, now might be the right time to apply because if you wait a year and you're still manager, then it's like, oh, or you wait two years. Well, now we have, you know, five years of experience and my manager. Well, it's kind of expected that you would be a manager. But to make it after three years is actually really, really good. Um, so there is more of an expectation for you to be more successful as you have more years of experience. And there's also a bit more of an expectation for you to know what you're going to be doing in your career and your plans to be, you know, a little bit more solidly sort of uh, you know, laid out. So yeah, that, that's something about the expectations. I would say there's a little bit less of an expectation from an like academic ability, but not that much less. So don't take that and run out and say, no, I don't need to take the GMAT. Scott told me it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, younger applicants tend to be a little bit stronger um, academically on average. Is it possible to get accepted to top tier schools with a 2.8 GPA and a 710 GMAT? So I would need to look at more details in your entire application to determine that. What I will say is, it is a very competitive year. Um, you know, it, this is a hard year, like last year was certainly an easy year. Most people got in, this is a tough year. So if I see 2.8 and I see 710, I'm, I'm probably gonna hesitate. Um, that said, you know, I wanna know what is your definition of a top tier school? I wanna know what you've done from a professional standpoint to evaluate that. But I would say you certainly do wanna think about retaking uh, the GMAT as a, a starting point. 
is moving to strategy consulting considered as a valid answer for why MBA? Uh, I'm at a crossroad in my career, and thus there is a little more nuance as well, but would love to get your view on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Look at look at the class profiles, right? Um, or the, the career you know, prospects. You have a third of the class going to consulting after business school. So it's definitely a valid reason. You know, a lot of people, you know, come to us and they say, well, you know, I, I can't say I want to do banking or I can't say I want to do consulting because that's what everybody does. And, and I'm not going to differentiate myself. You don't want to differentiate yourself as you're thinking about post MBA goals. You want to write something that's actually going to happen um, because schools are evaluating you and they want to see, can this person accomplish this goal? Is, is he or she going to come on campus, be successful? Is he going to flounder? You know, is he going to be in our career services office every week wanting help and we don't have the resources to help him because he doesn't realize that he actually can't be a partner at, a, at, at you know, an XYZ firm immediately after graduating when he's done nothing like that, you know, beforehand, right? So you really want to think about the, the realism of these goals. Strategy consulting is a, probably a fine goal for most applicants, right? Because consulting firms don't need tons of prior relevant experience. They teach you what they want you to be, be doing. Um, hi, hi as well. <laughs> Thanks for the, the, the call out. Um, okay, so what should undergraduates focus on now during their second and third year, especially since gaining hands-on experience in internships is together for applying three or four years later. Yeah, so this really depends on the applicant. Uh, you know, this is why we have these early MBA planning packages to guide you individually. There's not one particular thing, but I would say focus on trying to define your story, right? Think about who you are, you know, what are some things that you want to be doing to contribute to society? Are you, you know, focused on technical work? Are you focused on you know, business work? So it's, it's really tough to say um, specifically. Um, yeah, drop a mail ID. Yes, absolutely. So here, let me switch slides and I'll go to my contact info. Okay, so there's my contact info. Uh, Scott at personalmbacoach.com. I will post it here and then I'll also post it. Let's see, I know how to do the banner, so I'm going to create a banner a banner and show that yes so here's my email address i'll leave that up there for a little bit so feel free to reach out and would love to chat let's see so so i've given my gmat uh 580 after fourth try my gpa is three out of four three years of work experience one move into strategy consulting in canada um so I think you probably, I mean, depending on what schools you want to go for, I think you probably want to keep moving with the GMAT. I know after taking it a few times, it's super stressful and it's you know tough to sort of uh, keep moving. But look us up. We have amazing tutors. We can definitely help you to improve your score. I think you want to you want to keep moving um, to try to get your score a little bit higher so you can be more competitive, especially in a, a challenging year. Um, okay, I'm currently in it audits or three years of experience and okay so i think that was the yep yeah, so we had that um how different are full-time versus part-time applications yeah that's a great question right so we do a lot of uh, both full-time and part-time applications at personal mba coach the applications are not terribly different you know what is different is you want to convince the schools that there's a reason for you going part-time Right. So, you know, why are you, you know, why are you kind of going, going to school um, and working at the same time? Why not take a break or maybe vice versa? So they want to see what you're going to be giving back to your, your company. They want to see what your, you know, track record is like at the firm and what potentially some future opportunities, you know, look like for you at the job. Um, and then they also want to know, you know, a bit about how you're going to be you know, bringing your learnings from work into the classroom on, on a daily basis. So it's a little bit different, um, but overall, you know, application process is similar. Questions are different, um, but we do a lot of part-times. I'm happy to, to chat about that um, offline as well. So I think I've got most of the questions. Uh, if other folks have questions, feel free to, to type them in here. Um, And happy to answer them. We have a few more minutes here. Uh, 
And I'll just give some other you know, words of advice as a couple more questions are, are coming in. All right, as you're thinking about your process and uh, timing, I hear from a lot of folks, you know, is this the right year for me to apply? It's a competitive year. You know, I don't know if, if it's you know, sort of worth it, people were deferring, that, that sort of thing. Think about your timing and your profile more than what else is happening around us. Because if it's the right time for you, you, know, you have four or five years of experience, you feel like you're kind of plateauing a little bit in your career, you want to do something different, you're sick of doing X and you want to go on and do Y, it's a great time to be applying. Uh, it's a really a long-term investment here. So don't focus so much on what's happening you know, today. Um, as far as the competitiveness, it is a tough year. Numbers are up, you know, more people are applying. It is going to be harder to, to get in this year for sure. And uh, there was a lot of speculation right early. And I, I've been giving talks on all this stuff like all year, you know, since January and February, what's happening. It was all speculation. Now we have numbers, right? We, we, see, what's, we see what's happening. You know, we're, we're sort of figuring out what's what's going on in the space. So it is a tough year, but I'm not sure that next year is going to be easier because this year you still have some people that are not sure because of COVID and because of everything that that means and some potential like, you know, remote learning and, and distancing and all of that. You know, there are some people that are like hesitating. And next year, if the situation doesn't prove from a medical standpoint, then they could all sort of jump into the mix as well. So I don't know that it's really going to be getting a lot easier. And so I would just apply when it's the right time for you. That said, if you're really early in your career and you, you're thinking of jumping in, you know, may, maybe maybe wait a few years um, you know, for things to kind of settle out. But I don't know that from one year to the next, we're really going to have uh, much that's, that's actually uh, different here. So let's see. Um, okay, so I've lived in Central European country for over four and a half years. The multiple projects were across Europe. How... Will that bodes my international experience is that a significant advantage yeah it's it's always an advantage to have experience working in another country so depending on where you're from <clears throat> i don't know if you're from india but let, let's say you are and then you have some experience in europe i think that's better than you know staying in, in delhi for your whole life and, and, and career so i think that's definitely part of the process um, and we can chat more about that offline but i do like the international exposure um, how good are the MBA prospects in Harvard, Stanford, Wharton with a jury of 325 for an Indian engineer from top tier and working as a fellow with Indian government and development sector? So without knowing more about you, what I can say is 325 is low uh, for an Indian applicant to the top three schools, especially in a really competitive year. So I would recommend that you try to bump that up further before applying. Uh, could you get in anyway? Certainly. Once I know more about you, I would be able to weigh in that in a, in a little bit more detail um but i think that uh, you know just from what i see right here i would i would try to bump that score up a little bit more um let's see so would you suggest you try with a quantitative course to show showcase the quant abilities if you're not sure if your gmat will will increase so yeah so for someone that maybe has reached the wall in their gmat studying and and for everyone there's a a ceiling and it's really tough to to go past that first of all try with us I, i'm confident that we can help you to raise your score even a little bit but let's say you're at that at that ceiling then taking other quant classes is a smart thing to do i like taking classes at uh, berkeley and ucla online they're reasonably priced, they're easy to sign up for, they have a lot of different options and the uh, availability is pretty flexible. So taking a few classes and getting A's would be one way to show the schools that you do have some analytical abilities and you can, you can demonstrate that. Now that said, uh, most of the sort of brownie points come from the exam. So it's not enough to say like, get a really low score, take four classes, get A's, and then think that you'll be getting accepted. That probably still won't happen. You know, but it is nice to, to supplement. I like to say courses count for like maybe 20% and the GMAT is 80% or maybe even 90%. And courses are maybe like 10, 10 to, to 20%. So, so yeah, so have time for like maybe a couple more, more questions here as we, as we kind of wrap up, but really appreciate all the questions. I hope everyone is, you know, staying safe, uh, staying as healthy as, as you can these days. And again, if you want to reach out, you know, Scott at uh, personalmbacoach.com. Feel free to reach out. We'd we'll be happy to, to chat further. I know some of you asked for the information, so I now posted the email address on here. And watch for us for other videos. Watch the rest of the spotlight. We'll be doing other events. We'll be doing, we'll be doing uh, something in 
in, in India and uh, in Europe and South America. So if anyone's going to any of those regional fairs, we'll probably see you there shortly. Uh, wait another couple minutes in case anyone has any last questions before we close out today. Please answer a question of score for non-engineer Indian profile. Okay, so there's one question that I missed here. So let's see. Um, so for Indian applicants, how does top five to 10 percentile translate to a GPA? Also, what's a good GMAT score for non-engineering Indian male profile? The standard for Indian engineering male is much higher. So I think that if, if, if you look at you know, school sort of classes and profiles overall. Yes, engineers are more competitive than non-engineers, but if you're an Indian male from India applying, I don't think that you have a different GMAT requirement if you're an engineer versus not an engineer. I don't think that's the case. Um, so I know that might not be what you want to hear, but that's my my take on it. Um, as far as translate, we don't translate to GPAs at all. So I, I don't think that's something that's worth doing. None of the translators work. The, you know, don't, look it up, certainly don't, don't pay for anything. If a school requires you using a WES or something to translate it, if they require you, you can do it, but we don't we don't translate anything here because I just compare you to your peers and I know how everybody's is doing in all, all these schools. So, you know, top 5% is top 5%. So that's pretty good. You know, you can assume that that's kind of like a 3.8 GPA, let's say, plus or minus. It depends on the school, of course, and how schools grade. Some schools are grading really easily. Some are grading harder. When I was an undergrad, you know, the average grade, I went to MIT, the average grade at Harvard was an A minus. And, you know, so, you know, below average was like a, a B plus, you know, so it's, it's really different for every school, but I'd say top 5% is strong. And if you got top 5% wherever you studied, uh, I wouldn't be concerned about your academic performance from an undergraduate standpoint. I think that's very strong. So uh, let's see. So last follow-up question. So 330, 334, yes, yeah. So if, if you're into the low to mid 330s, that that would be a better score um, to target, I would say. And let's see, what would be the minimum requirement in terms of GMAT work experience position held in college for a deferred program from a top school? So there's, you know, I, the stats are gonna be similar as far as test scores. The test scores are not drastically different for deferred applicants. So I would go with that. You know, I'd like to target a 750, let's say, uh, you know, based on what I'm, what I'm seeing here, but it really just sort of uh, depends. There's no minimums for other things like work experience and things. You're, you're in college, so they're just assuming that you're mostly studying and then you only have the summers. Um, so um, great, so gap of nine months of career, how to handle this issue. Yeah, so this may be the last question that answered today before some, some closing words. Um, if you have a gap, right, first of all, you wanna be honest about what, what happens. Um, the good news about everything that's happening, I shouldn't say good news, but the, the situation today is that a lot of people do have gaps and people are losing their jobs or they're getting furloughed. And so if you are not working now or you were not working, you know, during the height of when, you know, coronavirus first came about, then that's actually okay. We've gotten people accepted to schools that weren't working. So you just want to be honest and say, what, what happened? Did you get fired? Did the company shut down? You know, why, why is there, there a gap? Um, so I would just explain that in an optional essay. So thank you everyone for your time. Really appreciate all the questions. This was a lot of fun. Uh, great to meet you all. Best of luck. Again, email address is scott at personalmbcoach.com and look forward to hearing from everybody soon. Take care and stay safe.